Andropov is still alive. His bus pass paraded in Red Square. <laughs> Black road crash victim sues colorblind surgeon who gave him two new legs. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher filmed secretly while recovering from her eye operation. <laughs> the Women's March for Jobs and the Women's March for Cushy Jobs. <laughs> Cabbage Patch soldiers arrive in Britain. <laughs> and the medical world reeled in astonishment when Barry Manilow became the first man to be delivered of a test tube baby. <laughs> Looking in their eyes, I see a memory. I never realized how happy you made <laughs> Hello, those short clips of BBC archive film depicting just a few of the memorable events of 1983 probably give you a clue as to what this programme is about. It's a kind of retrospective glance at the year gone by. It's a compilation of the most notable events that occurred during the past 12 months. But mainly, it's an excuse to make a cheap programme using old bits of film that even Channel 4 didn't want to buy. Now, you may be one of those people who feel it necessary to be aware of world news and events or on the other hand, you may be the editor of the Daily Star. But whatever your attitude, I'm sure you'll remember some of the main headlines of 1983. Headlines like... Cecil Parkinson is... Randy. Welcome to the bracing backwaters of Berkshire, where 72 of Mother Nature's most beautiful women have gathered to try and secure that most coveted of titles, Miss Greenham Common, 1983. Some of the contestants have travelled here from as far away as Regent's Park Zoo, and the air of expectation is electric. One novel aspect of this year's glittering contest is that the girls parade wearing their swimsuits, national costumes, and evening dresses, all at the same time. <laughs> the judges have now adjudicated, and now seven excited finalists are chosen to go on to the grand final, where the selectors will be looking for personality. Miss Abattoir, have you got any personality? No. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Who will win this prestigious title, along with a personal check for rabies and a year's supply of chemical toilet cleaner. <laughs> and here she comes. Yes, it's the favorite, Miss Halitosis. Congratulations. Well done. And... <laughs> Of course, law and order was a big issue this year with the police coming in with a lot of sticks. Uh, coming in for a lot of stick. <laughs> but there were two sides to every story, and the police could provide a third. It's a grand life in the Metropolitan Police. You get to meet such interesting people. Child molesters, racketeers, porn merchants. Then, when you leave the station, you've got to deal with criminals as well. <laughs> anyway, first off this morning, it was down to the training school for a refresher course in the basics of police work. A is for arrest. B is for black bastard. <laughs> C is for uh, kettle. Then it was off for a few raids. Keith Richards' larder. The Liberal <laughs> Club. <laughs> and finally, down the kitchens at the Cafe Royal, we're I'm pleased to say the food's now being prepared much more hygienically. <laughs> I remember things got a bit rough in Brixton after we beat up 60 blacks. It wasn't our fault. 
We thought they was all David Martin. <laughs> we learned a lot from the David Martin incident. So, at the end of the day, it was down to the range for some firearms training. No loose ends to that case. Another criminal brought to justice. And for the police, another shattering triumph. Well, it was a mini, actually. But the police are only human, I think, and could be baffled. Perhaps the biggest and as yet unsolved mystery of 1983 was the strange disappearance of Wonder Horse Shergar. A priceless example of equine breeding, not just because he was the only horse ever to be born with red legs, but also <laughs> because his value at stud was second only to that of Warren Beatty. Shergar was kidnapped late at night by a person or persons unknown, but the Labour Shadow Cabinet strongly deny the accusation. Minutes after Shergar's disappearance, the local police chief was on the job when he was disturbed by a phone call. <laughs> Excuse me, darling. Damn telephone. What? Was Shergar kidnapped? We're very well, Sergeant. Round up the usual suspects. Sir, we can't raid every Chinese restaurant in the country. <laughs> the police were baffled by the kidnapper's motives. Was Shergar taken by someone who needed the thrill of an excellent ride? <laughs> by someone who simply wants to show off? Or, as some of the racing fraternity suspect, did Shergar plan the kidnap himself because he didn't like the look of his new jockey? <laughs> Every avenue of inquiry came to a fruitless end. It was as though the earth had opened up and Shergar had been swallowed by Belgian coal miners. <laughs> Shergar's disappearance soon captured the attention of the general public and in the first few weeks, hundreds of apparent sightings were reported to the police. But most of these turned out to be Princess Anne. <laughs> and of course, there were cranks. Can I help you, sir? Are you the man in charge of the missing Shergar case? I am. Who are you? I'm Shergar. <laughs> So you're Shergar, are you? Yes. Well, you've got eyes on the side of your head, so I better just check your hoof prints. <coughs> but forensic tests proved that the crank was not Shergar. Apart from the moustache and national health spectacles, the police noticed that he was about two feet shorter than Shergar, even allowing for the circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, guards were mounted at the royal stables with strict orders to kill any suspicious-looking cockroaches. So where is Shergar? And how have the kidnapped gang managed to evade capture, even though a series of brilliant identical pictures were posted worldwide, but to no avail? <laughs> it's a mystery that may never be solved. English soccer fans go on the rampage in Luxembourg. <laughs> Oil rig workers return to mainland to replace their worn-out inflatable women. <laughs> Pay increase announced for Glasgow lavatory cleaner. <laughs> the Prince and Princess of Wales entertain the Prime Minister of Japan. <laughs> Back from Africa, Queen Elizabeth shows effects of staying out too long in hot sun. Last night, these people went to their local theatre to see Ted Rogers in Cabaret. Today, they are in a deep coma, beyond the help of conventional medicine. Serves them right for going, you may say. But what about these people? They were only passing the theatre and heard the jokes through an open window. Innocent victims of the deadly disease, Ted's. We need your money to continue our research into this disease. Under laboratory conditions, this man is told a Cyril Smith joke. This girl is having poisoned needles inserted into her brain to simulate three to one conditions. And a man who thought he'd never laugh again is given special physiotherapy. Please give generously. Better dead than Ted. But now for the results of the Spooch Macca of the Year competition. Spooch A, Ronald Reagan. We cannot afford the luxury of turning away from our neighbor's struggle as if they didn't matter. If we do turn away, we'll pay a terrible price for our neglect. So let me put it bloody. 
<laughs> Spooch B, Cecil Parkinson. We don't regard the Alliance as our enemy. We don't like the Alliance. We regard the real threat to this country and the real threat to us as the, concern, as the Labour Party. <laughs> Spooch C, Ronald Reagan again. They are arming, training, supplying, and encouraging a war to subjugate another nation to communism, and that nation is El Salvador. The Soviets and the Cubans... <laughs> Spooch D, Arthur Scargill. I'm not prepared to quietly accept the destruction of the coal mining industry, and nor am I willing to see our social services utterly demonstrated. <laughs> Spooch E, F, G, and H, Ronald Reagan yet again. And we must never forget that here in the Western America, Western Hemisphere, we are Americans in every country from pole to pole. <laughs> and the winner again, Spooch I. <laughs> the Reverend Ian Paisley. <laughs> Ian as eloquent as ever. Meanwhile, Britain was basking in a tremendous heat wave. It was so hot, people were buying tickets for Magnus Pike lectures just to sit in the cool draft of his rotating arms. <laughs> Welcome to the sunny, slapstick, silly season of good old Great Britain, that fun-loving gateway to the Arctic Circle. Yes, the sun has got his hat on and everyone's coming out to play. But not much room to play on this beach, though, where the deck chair attendant used to work as a packer for John West. <laughs> And here's another holiday pair, jostling for position. Anyone for tennis? Wow. There's one in the eye for the umpire, or two if he's lucky. Hello. Here's a handful of guys hoping to get a handful of our titular tennis player. Let me through. I'm a Prince of Wales. Yes, as the silly, screwy season of sunshine hots up, the ladies have a problem cooling down. But not this one. She's rich enough to hire her own mobile air conditioner from Dr. Bernardo's. While the rest of the heat-crazed masses simply frolic under the corporation showers. What loonies, what locos, what pillars. Whatever the heat, we've still got to eat. And along with a summertime spree of slapstick comes the saucy chocolate. But not in this Tesco store, where the daffy rule is that shoppers must leave their personal belongings at the checkout. What a cheek. Hey, madam, if you're not going to buy those melons, will you please put them back? <laughs> For soup, the plot thickens as a couple of sneaky store detectives keep an eye on our stock naked shoppers through a two-way mirror. Let's see. What's he got there, darling? <laughs> that doesn't deter these players from Queen's Park Rangers as they get down to some basic training, while the aptly named Arsenal get down to some very basic training. <laughs> no surprise after the crap games they've been playing lately. Hotter and hotter, wackier and wackier. It only takes a ray of shimmering sunshine to bring out the best in Britain's secret army of practical pranksters. For instance, who put centipods in the soldier's tea? <laughs> who designed this hat for Gertrude Schilling? And who sold this woman a booklet on do-it-yourself abortion? <laughs> yes, it's fun for all and all for fun in the crazy carnival of summer. And what better way to leave this mayhem of madcap merriment than with a daffy demonstration of mirthful magic. Now you see it, now you don't. <laughs> oh, Mr. Lawson, we've cleaned the chimney. Please, can we come down now? <coughs> Let's hear it for the great British breakfast.
In employment, the government stuck to the policy of real jobs, which meant one man doing the job of ten. Some organisations were criminally undermanned, none more so than the waterworks and sewage industry, who were on strike in February. Ted Hurd, the moderate shop steward of a typical British sewage plant, put his case to the country. There's just the eight of us running this whole sewage disposal plant, and it's hard graft, no mistake. After an 18-hour shift underground, we come out of the tunnel feeling like we've just sat through a Richard Attenborough after-dinner speech. That's my mate Brownie. He used to be Britt Eklund's milkman, but doctors told him to find a less strenuous job. And that's me, being carried out by four lads from Quality Control. I've been working on the Turkish restaurant pipes for three shifts on the trot. I've done my best to get conditions improved for the men, but all I've managed so far is to win a dispute over washing up facilities. <laughs> but I feel there's still room for improvement. I try to have regular meetings with management, but it's a waste of time. The Tories have pulled a fast one on us. They've put an ex-Japanese war criminal in charge of the works, and he can hardly speak a word of English. He's not interested in our grievances, he just keeps repeating his favourite joke about promotion prospects in sewerage and how there are plenty of big jobs floating about. <laughs> Sometimes I call a union meeting to discuss our tactics for the next round of pay talks and believe me, some of my members can get very steamed up at times. Another thing that makes me fume, apart from the materials we work with, is that we don't get compensation for industrial injuries. Take Charlie, for instance. He never received a penny from the time he fell over and dislodged his Arthur Scargill wig. <laughs> <laughs> to sum up, I'd say we want a better deal for our members who work in sewage. We're just fed up of being shat on. <laughs> <laughs> what do Arthur Scargill, Bruce Forsyth, Frankie Howard and Terry Wogan all have in common? Yes, they're all as bald as second-hand tyres. Here at the Barnet Baldy Sanctuary, with their heads as naked as nature intended, they can relax and spend a few precious moments away from their toupees. In the garden, conjurer Paul Daniels receives a sympathetic hearing from the Prince of Wales, for however much the magic dwarf may wave his wand, he cannot wave his hair. <laughs> Civil Service Secretary complains of sexual harassment by minister. <laughs> Surgeons take unique film showing what goes on inside Sir Keith Joseph's brain. <laughs> Diet conscious Diana Dawes leaves a note for the butcher. <laughs> Joan Collins gets a new leading man. <laughs> and British housewives are questioned about their attitude towards sex. I do that every Tuesday and Thursday in the House of Commons. The government announced plans to abolish the big metropolitan county councils, including the GLC, which of course brought storms of protest from the Kremlin. The Tories simply feel these regional monolithic bureaucracies are a complete waste of ratepayers' money. If it's a normal working week like Wednesday, I'm usually up at the crack of 10.30. I always check my casino numbers in the morning star, and then I wander into the bathroom to practice pulling my funny faces. You know, I like this Remington razor so much, I'm going to nationalise the company. If I see any cameramen about, I always walk to the office, but if the coast is clear, I use the company car. When I'm at the office, I like to be treated as an ordinary employee. I have no delusions of grandeur. That's why I insist on using an ordinary office with a small desk. As leader of the Labour Control GLC, I have to rely heavily on my friend David. He's teaching me how to read and write. <laughs> David reckons very soon I'll be able to write my name in joined up letters. The telephone never stops ringing. Usually it's some lesbian action group desperate for a grant to help buy more batteries. I used to get lots of calls from my next door neighbour complaining about my pet lizards crawling up her lavatory bowl. But I bring my lizards to work with me now. It's against the rules, so I have to keep them hidden. <laughs> Our 
After lunch, I always submit a verbal summary of council progress and a preliminary accounting report on expenditure. But I somehow get the feeling that my flowers are not interested. I enjoy talking to flowers. I have to because no one else listens to me. After my session with the flowers, I put on my disguise and go into the council chamber. I'm a realist, I suppose. I feel that if you're going to speak like an old woman, you may as well look like one. <laughs> After the day's business, I either walk back home, or if I have a few hours to spare, I travel the two miles by British Rail. I like the train because I can relax in the quiet and seclusion, and it gives me a chance to meditate in a transient interlude of analytic self-appraisal of mind and body or I look out of the window at the cows and the sheep. Basically, I, I think I'm the right man to run the GLC. And let's face it, I'm better qualified intellectually than some of those loonies in the Tory party. Mr Mugabe, what did you say to the dentist? Ah. <laughs> Catholic parents demonstrate the only form of contraception <laughs> recognized by the church. <laughs> Birthdays, it's a super scale extrix for Prince William. <laughs> Strathclyde Transport introduced first genuine door-to-door -door bus service. <laughs> British scientists demonstrate new robot civil servants. <laughs> Neil Kinnock becomes Britain's champion sperm donor. <laughs> Hope regrets sending his hat to a cheap laundry. <laughs> well, as they say with that sort of inflection, which means, right, that's your lot. That's 1983. I think you'll agree that I've attempted, and very successfully, in my opinion, to present an accurate and unbiased picture of the year's events. And I think any intelligent audience would agree with that. Because you are intelligent, aren't you? Yes! I do. yes. It only remains for me to offer you my sincere wishes for a very happy new year and also to give you the address to which you can send your complaint. Dance, dance, dance. 